Scientific Director of the University of Sydney Nano Institute, Sydney Nano, one of the university's uh, multidisciplinary initiatives. Um, this today is um, one of our flagship uh, events, the Sydney Nano Distinguished uh, Lecture. Um, I will allow Fariba, my colleague, to introduce the speaker, but it's uh, very exciting. Um, and aligns uh, clearly with Sydney Nano's academic framework. As you would know, Nano Health, Nano Medicine is a priority for Sydney Nano. We've had excellent engagement with um, the health and medicine uh, ecosystem at the University of Sydney. So really looking forward to the uh, seminar. We've got a great speaker. Um, but before we do uh, begin the proceedings, I would like to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I'm indeed on Gadigal land. I know you're probably not, but um, if you'd like to just let share with us where you are through the chat, I think that's the usual protocol. Um, it is upon their ancestral lands that the University of Sydney is built. As we share our knowledge, teaching, learning and research practices within this university, may we also pay respect to the knowledge embedded forever um, within the custodianship of country. Um, so with those remarks, uh, pleased to ask uh, Fariba to introduce the speaker and look forward to this fantastic session. Thanks very much. Thank you, Ben. Uh, good morning. I'm Professor Fariba Dehkani, the Director of the Center for Advanced Food Engineering and also the Director of the Research in Bioengineering in the School of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering. I'm very delighted to introduce our distinguished speaker, Professor Ali Qadem Husseini, to the Sydney Nano community. I knew our speaker, Ali, since 2007 when I met him in a conference, and I was always impressed by his impressive research and achievements. He completed his PhD under supervision of Professor Bob Langer at MIT and then commenced his academic career at the Harvard Medical School. During this uh, period, he was also associate faculty at the Wiz Institute for biological inspired engineering. At Harvard, at Harvard University, he, decided, he directed the Biomaterials Innovation Research Center as well, a leading initiative in making engineered biomedical material. Then in 2017, he joined UCLA as a professor of bioengineering. Ali is currently the CEO and founding director at the Teresaki Institute for Biomedical Innovation. During his academic career, he has received many awards. And I never forget uh, when I visited his office in Harvard Medical School. His big office was full of these awards and there was no space left on the wall to add any more awards. He always gives very impressed, inspiring talks. And I'm very sure you all will enjoy his speech today for engineering in precision medicine. Over to you, Ali. Thank you very much, Fariba, for the very kind introduction. It's always uh, wonderful to um, get connected to the University of Sydney and uh, the, uh, I think the nano uh, Institute is also doing some really fantastic stuff. I can look at the audience and recognize many names of um, good friends and colleagues. So I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, just uh, want to make sure now you see my slides. Awesome. All right. So, um, so today I'm going to tell you a little bit about the work that um, we've been doing, um, particularly in the area of uh, personalized medicine and really um, get people acquainted with a little bit with the what the Institute is also doing. Um, I'm going to try to do that over the next uh, 40 minutes or so, and then hopefully we'll have some time for questions afterwards. Before uh, I start, um, these are some of my conflicts. And, <clears throat> and also, um, I've, I've been getting more and more into entrepreneurship. So it's very exciting that um, I, when I visited the University of Sydney, I, I saw so many activities in that area as well. So as Farima mentioned, I've been um, about almost two years ago, I wanted to um, try building an institute that was focused on um, innovation, particularly 
um, in the context of a setting which was um, to some degree had more flexibility for academic entrepreneurs, particularly with respect to being able to straddle the world of nonprofit um, um, academic setting with the for-profit uh, industrial setting. And I, I felt that it would be great to do it in a context that was um, to some degree had a clean slate. So what this, um, the Terasaki Institute is not officially part of any university. Um, so it's its own um, entity. And this allows us to actually um, create the kind of uh, policies um, that allows us to be more flexible. At the same time, of course, um, do a lot of things on managing conflict of interest and things associated with that. Um, so um, for people who may not know, um, the, the Tarasaki Institute is uh, come from um, a, a donation or a, a foundation that was endowed by um, Dr. Paul Terasaki. Dr. Terasaki was the person who discovered the approach about how uh, donors and recipients can basically match um, so that they wouldn't get rejected from each other's uh, tissues. So, so this was very important for enabling the whole area of transplantation, uh, which has become um, really a lifesaver for many um, um, types of um, ailments. So <clears throat> the Institute is um, has a particular mission of really trying to be the world's best place for academic entrepreneurs and specifically to try to um, invent and foster practical solutions um, and that enhances the, that restores or enhances the health of individuals. And when you think about um, this mission statement, there's a couple of things. One is of course the invent but also this foster, um, fostering is also a very important aspect of what we try to do. We actually have um, a number of initiatives here to um, be able to really uh, bridge this valley of death. And uh, we're currently pushing a number of startups that are really being incubated within the Institute and we provide a lot of resources for them to, um, to become, um, to have a chance of becoming successful. And of course, we're located in LA, which in many ways is, um, I see similarities between Sydney and LA in their nature and um, the um, beaches and a lot of other things. Um, the climate is very similar. <clears throat> and then um, recently we purchased um, this building as well, which is gonna be our third building, um, which is gonna uh, basically add an additional footprint for our lab. Um, and, and innovation um, uh, functionalities. So the Institute has a number of different um, areas that it works on. And most of it, as um, we mentioned, revolves around creating things that um, can really um, help the health of individuals. And um, these include a number of different areas like biomaterials, like being able to develop materials that um, that are tailored to an individual's um, needs. Um, a few years ago, working with Fariba um, and uh, Dr. Tony Weiss, um, we worked on materials like um, elastin-based materials that um, Tony had developed, and we worked on making them into things like surgical sealants. Uh, we worked with other colleagues in trying to develop materials that were um, applicable for intravascular um, injection um, and um, addressing things like um, internal bleeding and um, filling aneurysms and other defects. And that's a whole different category of materials. Um, and this really, the idea with personalized materials is to develop materials that are um, in some ways smart enough to respond to what an individual's needs are. So if you're implanting it or using it in contact with the body, the material can um, provide the right kind of properties of what that individual needs. <clears throat> we also work on devices quite a bit. Um, these would be devices that are either wearable or implantable um, or, or can be part of general surgical tools. Um, and these devices um, allows us to 
um, have um, embedded sensors and uh, potentially um, um, algorithms that can sense and be able to respond to what that individual needs. So these are things like, um, uh, for example, a smart uh, wound healing system that can deliver drugs as needed or, uh, or other types of um, um, advances in um, medical devices that allows us to actually take what's been not changed for almost 100 years and be able to add additional functionality to it. We also work a lot on personalized cells, particularly in trying to direct the behavior of stem cells or immune cells and be able to make them in a way that we can um, control their behavior and then use them for a variety of different ailments. <clears throat> for today, I'm not really gonna talk about the top part. I'm gonna focus um, on some aspects of the bottom part, which is um, on personalized implants and personalized physiological models. Um, and these two um, are related to basically making tissues um, that have particular um, um, structure or functionality um, and we can potentially implant them or we can use these tissues in vitro as models of human physiology and then be able to um, use them as predictive tools for drug discovery or other types of uh, needs um, that, that are um, required. And, um, and Pariba mentioned her involvement with the, um, with the food center. Uh, we also have an interest in personalized nutrition, which is a whole a new aspect of our research, which um, addresses ways in which we can try to have um, ad, um, advancements in food tech um, that could, um, again, either uh, um, um, enhance wellness or prevent sickness as needed. So first I'm gonna talk about, <clears throat> a little bit about this whole area of organs on a chip or personalized physiological models and maybe then talk a little bit about um, some of the bioprinting work that we've done. And um, hopefully then by that time, we'll have enough for time for questions. So for regarding this whole area of personalized physiological models, the reason why it's needed is because of the big bottlenecks, bottlenecks in drug discovery um, and the development process. So as, as you all know, um, this is a very expensive and uh, long, um, long process that has many different steps. <clears throat> so it's um, when you think about the, the, the development process, it's almost like a funnel. You typically start off with a lot of different candidates and then you try to kind of um, make them into less and less uh, number and then be able to subsequently identify the one that's going to be the drug. Now, as you go through this process, um, the numbers um, regarding how much investment you need um, goes up and also the timing can be up to a decade or longer. Now, typically, if you've already in, let's say, a later stage, like a phase three clinical trial, you've already spent hundreds of millions of dollars. And if you fail at this stage, then that's all money that's been pretty much wasted. So it's very important in this process to be able to fail as fast as possible. So you don't get to the stages where you're testing these on lots of different people, and then you start seeing the issues that are uh, associated with that. And it's because of these failures that the R&D budget of the pharma companies are really astronomical and likely with um, the kind of um, diseases that we have uh, coming around the corner, this um, is uh, nowhere to, uh, there's no um, savior for this. So why does this happen? Well, when you think about why these drugs fail, you see that the majority of the failure is really due to um, our inability to predict the efficacy of the drugs as well as their safety. And this by far are the two most um, uh, abundant reasons about why drugs fail. Now, you can't even have other cases where you have approved drugs that actually wind up um, being toxic. So Vioxx was a very well publicized example of that. That was uh, a drug that uh, Merck had to recall and it wound up um, not only um, killing a number of people, 
but also being a huge mess with respect to its, um, uh, we call a very expensive process. Um, <clears throat> so the challenge with all of these is that we can't really predict what's gonna be effective and safe in humans. And a lot of it is because when we test drugs, we use uh, standard tissue culture dishes or animal models, which don't recreate the complexity of human physiology. So with that um, mindset, there's been a work in trying to uh, develop technologies uh, that address this and um, using 3D tissue models, uh, we can uh, start having better ways of um, creating some of these. So um, the, the vision, long-term vision is to really be able to recreate many aspects of human physiology by being able to use techniques like tissue engineering and microfluidics and biosensing and integrating them together so that we can have uh, tissues that can predict human tissue response. And in addition to just having that um, individual tissue functionality, we can even interconnect these tissues to be able to have system behavior so that you have um, uh, <clears throat> barrier tissues like the lung, the gut, and the skin. You can have structural tissues like bone and muscle, and you can have other types of tissues like functional tissues with respect to liver and kidney and heart, which are all very important. So by having this um, different types of um, systems, you can actually model human physiology much better. So there's been a lot of work in this in the past few years. So um, uh, when you think about what has been done, basically we've been going from uh, 2D monolayers that have typically been animal cells and individual cell and tissue type to 3D constructs that, better have, that have better functionality, they use the right cells, typically primary human cells or IPS drive cells that have the right kind of behavior and use the fluidics and other types of sensing to be able to um, add additional components that are needed and read out what's needed. So when you, when you see the different types of things that has been done, virtually uh, every tissue has been attempted to be modeled. And when you see the examples, you start seeing a number of different trends. For example, you see that um, in these examples, there's much better appreciation of the tissue architecture. Um, you see things like blood vessels or the intestinal villi or the lung having structures that actually mimic some of their native counterparts. And then the other thing is that you start seeing that there's appreciation of the different cells that makes the tissue, as well as the appreciation of the different types of biomolecules or uh, stimulation, whether they're physical, mechanical, um, biochemical, electrical, um, about how they, the tissue functions and how we can mature those tissues. So this is really important because it's allowed us to get to better and better models. So we started working in this uh, field a few years ago, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit of work that we've done in um, enabling this. And one of the things that you can see uh, from this kind of work is that um, uh, this is one of our early prototypes that you basically see a number of different things. There's uh, an incubator here where the organs on a chips are housed. And then there's a lot of other components around it. These are um, displays to monitor what's happening, sensors to see what's going, to kind of measure what's going on, as well as um, uh, pneumatic valving and pumping to actually control the fluids um, that are going around. So if you zoom into this box, uh, which is the um, incubator, what you have are these types of systems, which, which are modular, which are basically different types of modules put together to generate a specific kind of functionality. And these modules are typically put together around what we call a breadboard, which is a master fluidic controller. And to this, we can start attaching different types of um, or um, basically tissues. So these would be different types of um, organ modules, different types of fluidic modules, like uh, things like bubble traps and fluidic reservoirs and other things like that, as well as different types of sensors, whether they're 
um, sensors that use uh, physical or chemical aspects um, of the uh, medium or biochemical sensors that actually sense what is, let's say, being secreted by the cells and inferring about their behavior through that. So these are all um, important components. And just to show you some of the, um, how these things look visually, these are some examples of the early prototypes. And here you can see some, some of these in action. So here, for example, in the top, it's a bubble remover. So you can see the bubble kind of actually enter this microfluidic and then uh, system and then be removed. And in the bottom here, uh, right hand side, you see basically the valving uh, and pumping at work. You see that the colors are changing because we have control over the, uh, the fluidics and we can put different type of fluids inside these systems as needed. So <clears throat> um, when we think about what we attach to these kinds of breadboards, we basically, as I mentioned, have different units. Um, and one of them are the actual tissue uh, modules. And with the tissue modules, we have a different types of reactors, but these are again, early um, simple types of reactors, which are just resealable um, uh, microfluidic systems where we can have inlets and outlets and a chamber that we can um, put the tissues inside. And um, when we put the cells inside these little chambers, we can use different systems. We can use either um, bioprinting to be able to deposit the cells or the organoids into these um, um, chambers. Um, and we've been doing that with many different cell types, including liver and heart tissue, as well as we can have other types of patterning approaches to put the cells in these chambers, whether they're light patterning or actually um, using substrates to induce the elongation of the cells. These are all tools we can use to kind of control how the tissues are behaving in this. But one of the important things is to actually have the right um, tissue functionality um, and the right cell types. So we worked quite a bit on these systems as well. So for example, here um, you can see that these are um, liver organoids. So liver is a, um, within the body is a notoriously regenerative tissue. But once you take liver cells outside of the body, they very quickly um, um, die off. Um, so we've been able to maintain this liver functionality by taking primary uh, human liver hepatocytes um, and combining with other types of support cells, stellite cells, cofflar cells, and um, endothelial cells, um, and be able to um, have these uh, make organoids or micro tissues that actually have lots of different features and enzymatic expression of these um, uh, tissue types. Um, and at the same time, they remain viable. And they, when we maintain them, they remain viable over multiple weeks, a year up to at least four weeks, and, um, and express the enzyme that I mentioned. Now, the way to test whether we actually have a liver organoid or micro tissue that's actually functioning properly um, is to test its functionality by expressing, by um, exposing it to different types of chemicals. So in this experiment, in the bottom right, we've taken these micro tissues and exposed them to two different compounds that were initially approved by the FDA and then subsequently recalled um, uh, because of liver toxicity. So here we can actually get those kinds of uh, behaviors modeled. So we can actually take um, this liver organoids, as we start adding different concentrations of these compounds, we start seeing more of these um, red uh, markers, which indicate dead or dying cells, which shows that we can start having some toxicity associated with these. The other thing that we can do is make other tissues. And I'm going to show you one other example. This is a, a cardiac or heart muscle example. Obviously for heart, um, you can't take biopsies as you can with the liver. So what um, we try to do is to actually uh, be able to, um... oh, can you guys see my slides? I just saw Faribos thing, you can't see my slides. I hope you can see it because I've been 26 it's, it's, it's all good. Okay, all right. I saw a chat thing that we can't see your slides, so I got nervous. 
I'm like, no one's talking. It's, Australians are, I know, are polite, but this is too much. Um, <laughs> um, so, uh, so basically, um, you know, basically we have um, to make um, cardiac uh, tissues. Um, we, we can basically take uh, iPS cells, induced pluripotent stem cells, and then differentiate them to cardiac phenotypes. And then from these um, um, organoids, we can start basically getting a lot of functionality that we want. Um, and these um, cells remain viable. They beat um, either spontaneously or upon electrical stimulation. They have all the right um, um, architectural aspects of cardiac tissues. And when we challenge them with compounds that were initially approved by FDA and subsequently recalled due to cardiac toxicity, uh, we can actually get this kind of toxic behavior at higher concentrations. And we can also see things like beating rates of these um, tissue types decrease as we start getting to toxic concentrations. So these are the kind of things that one can do with healthy tissues. These are examples of healthy tissues, but obviously there's a lot of opportunity to make disease models as well. So here I'm gonna show you some examples of that. So uh, with respect to disease models, um, we've done a number of things and here's an example of them. One of them is uh, a disease called progeria. Um, um, there's a disease called progeria. And um, this disease is very interesting because it's a disease that uh, is a genetic disease that um, affects um, children that, that are born with that um, uh, um, genetic uh, mutation. And it's basically due to a, a point mutation in which in this uh, lamin A uh, post-translational modification, you basically cannot get the cleavage that normally occurs. And because of this mutation, you get um, the uncleaved protein, the progerin protein build up in the cells. And that causes a lot of inflammation in many different things that causes slow growth on uh, cardi cardiovascular and musculoskeletal issues. And typically these issues uh, compound um, to the dead level where these kids typically get stiff um, blood vessels um, that kind of mimics old age and they die uh, often in their teens. Now, our um, approach was to model this disease by being able to uh, take cells from uh, healthy donors and progeria uh, donors um, and, um, and then be able to make smooth muscle cells out of them. And the reason we wanted to kind of make smooth muscle cells is because uh, smooth muscle cells are what actually is, a, is one of the inflamed tissues that causes a lot of, um, a, a lot of um, basically recruitment of inflammatory cells and it causes um, the stiffening of the blood vessels. So we wanted to kind of see if we can model this disease in a chip. And the way we did it is um, we know that um, blood vessels um, not only have fluid flow through them, but they also have this cyclical dilation that's associated with the um, pumping of the heart every time. So we wanted to kind of model this behavior so we can make microfluidic channels in which the smooth muscle cells are seated on one side. And then there's a membrane that separates this from a separate chamber that is um, basically we can apply vacuum to. And when we apply the vacuum, there's a deformation in this channel. So the cells actually start sensing the mechanical deformation. And this allows us to start kind of getting some aspects of what the primary uh, smooth muscle cells undergo in the body. And of course we can control the degree of uh, mechanical deformation by controlling the, the pressure that is associated with this. And also uh, we see that the nucleus um, of these cells changes as they start um, uh, getting um, ex exposed to these pressures. Now, I'm going to show one slide here. Actually, maybe I'll start with this. Um, one slide here about how better is this system that I mentioned with the mechanical deformation compared to the normal Petri dish. And um, normally, when we try to look at these smooth muscle cells and whether they're actually creating an inflammatory um, system, you can start looking at gene expression of um, specific molecules 
that are uh, uh, basically cytokines or other kinds of molecules that are associated with this inflamed tissue behavior. And when we look at them in a Petri dish compared to our system, we see that in a Petri dish as shown in these gray bars, you don't really see too much of the expression. So they're not really mimicking the disease phenotype. But in these other systems that are biomechanically active, you start getting a lot of the expression of the, um, of the mRNA associated with this um, inflamed behavior. Now, the other thing that we can do once we have the disease model, we can start adding drug candidates and be able to see how those drugs are actually affecting things. And we wound up um, doing that. We, we took a couple of drug candidates and we start getting um, some specific behaviors um, in some of our results, suggesting that, in fact, some of these may actually be working. And we did this back in 2017. And uh, a year after we did this, the results of a couple of clinical trials came out, which actually showed that one of our drug candidates actually winds up um, significantly um, having a positive effect on uh, progeria patients and actually decreasing, um, 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 not only decreasing the phenotype, but also increasing the lifespan of these kids um, as well, which was really exciting because it, it's one of the first applications that shows that um, the, the organs on a chip can actually potentially be uh, predictive of real clinical trials. Um, so so that's, um, this is the kind of stuff that um, has uh, us and other people very excited. Um, and maybe <clears throat> with that, I'll just have one final example here before I maybe switch over to some um, um, other aspects. But this example is about how we can use these systems for even personalized medicine in a clinical setting. For example, being able to uh, take uh, tumor, uh, tumor samples from patients and then um, see which drugs are going to be effective on, on which tumors and which people. Um, so, so the idea here is to not only be able to take uh, potentially um, tumor cells and make a tumor model, but also be able to have, let's say, the cells, the healthy cells from the same tissue. So take, let's say, a uh, few skin cells and then be able to differentiate them into heart cells so that um, we can actually be able to have not only the diseased tissue, but also the healthy tissue and be able to run drugs through these kinds of loops and then see what happens um, to, the, to the system. So in this particular case, uh, we made these systems so that it's all fully automatic. Everything is run um, in an automatic way. We have a lot of sensors, whether they're um, kind of physical chemical sensors, uh, like temperature, pH, oxygen. We have a lot of mini microscopes attached to these tissues so we can look at their behavior without disrupting them. And also we have a lot of sensors to be able to measure biomolecules that are secreted by the cells. Like, for example, albumin and GST alpha for the liver, as well as CKMB for uh, the uh, cardiac component. And what we see is that as we start adding a drug compound like doxorubicin, uh, we see that um, the liver, which is the, in this case, the tumor tissue, um, starts um, having different behaviors with respect to its expression of albumin. And um, so albumin goes down, showing there's toxicity. And GST alpha, that is a molecule associated with liver toxicity, starts getting over, um, it starts getting uh, expressed, and we can detect it in the medium. Um, and same thing with the cardiac tissue. Now we can start seeing the side effects on the healthy tissue, where as we start increasing the doxorubicin concentration, we can see things like the CKMB molecule going up, uh, showing toxicity, and the beating rates of these things going down. So again, these are early stages. There's now uh, one of my colleagues has uh, come up with a company that um, is trying to take these types of things to the clinic and really um, uh, doing it with patient samples and um, the not right numbers to be able to actually uh, translate into a clinical setting. So I talked a lot about the uh, my, um, organs on a chip system so far, uh, but um, I wanted to also talk a little bit about what enables a lot of these, which is really better tools to make tissues. And um, we've been interested in this whole area of better tools through biofabrication for a number of years, whether that's to make better scaffolds or materials to uh, encapsulate the cells, to be able to put different um, um, 
technologies like molding or lithographic approaches to control cell behavior, to cross-link cells um, and materials inside fluidics to be able to um, uh, make structures or use uh, fibers or even self-assembly to do that. But uh, for the past few years, uh, we've been focusing more and more on bioprinting um, and specifically trying to use this technology um, to really get the types of uh, shapes and structures that we want. So um, when we think about how to make tissues, there's a number of um, things that we have to worry about. One is, you know, how do we get the right complexity? How do we make the right interactions between the different cells? How do we make the vasculature? How do we, um, if we're going to implant it, um, keep the cells alive? And how do we actually, if we're going to use these technologies, how do we use um, printers that have better speed and resolution? So um, as I mentioned, there's a lot of different work that we and other people have done in this uh, field. Um, um, early on work include things like being able to make vessel-like structures inside these gels um, so that you can actually put liquids through them. Um, and these, um, these would mimic the architecture of blood vessels and we can put endothelial cells in them, blood vessel cells. And even we can have uh, cells in the surrounding tissue kind of like how um, a, a vascular network is. Now um, we can take these types of things um, and the whole concept with a lot of these bioprinting systems is that you get the cells in the right environment and then you allow the cells to reorganize. So these are, here's an example where we can actually um, demonstrate this. So we can print a rod with these cells inside it and over time, the cells start in, um, kind of reorganizing. Initially, they're very rounded. <clears throat> over time, they start um, spreading more. And after like a couple of weeks, they look totally different. Um, and they started connecting and forming tissue-like structures. And these really is the principle associated with bioprinting so that we can actually get this um, tissues more and more mature. Now, there are a number of needs in this field. Um, these include uh, really making better bio inks, um, making um, inks that basically have better functionality and enhance survival of the cells, as well as making printers better themselves. And um, these, you know, as I mentioned, faster, higher resolution, and then being able to print with multiple materials. So for today, in the next really like five, six minutes, I'm just going to talk about um, mostly with the bio uh, multiple printing capability, because I think that's that's interesting. But just to let everyone know that we have worked quite a bit on the bio ink side. Um, um, sorry, this um, went a little too much. So the bio ink side. Um, so here, for example, um, you see some of the bio inks. Um, these could be different gels, which are now commercially available to different vendors. Uh, different types of what we call universal inks, which is kind of amicable to any type of a molecule that you want to embed in that 3D printed structure, uh, conductive inks and oxygen generating inks. And all of these are um, kind of work that um, we've been working on uh, quite a bit. Now, um, when it comes to what I would consider some of the challenges in the field, uh, as I mentioned, typically uh, bioprinters are designed, or really all 3D printers are designed to do one type of material. And if you start even getting to very fancy uh, printers, then they have like, let's say two or three or four, maybe up to six nozzles. And it's very complex um, methodology, but it's uh, very limited in what it can do. So we wanted to um, really make printers that were significantly better than that. And a few years ago, we started um, getting inspiration from nature itself. What nature does is that, for example, like what a spider does is that it has a number of different glands in its back and it can mix the, um, basically the components in these different glands to be able to basically secrete the silk of a particular property. So we can get this inspiration and then engineer it in a microfluidic channel so that there's a number of different inlets. Each one of them has, let's say, different um, um, type of material inside it. And each one is controlled by a, um, a computer controlled basically valve. So we can open and close these um, in a programmable way um, and then be able to extrude the type of material that um, is gonna be um, coming out in a very controllable way. 
So these are some examples. So imagine you have three different channels. Um, one of them has a material that's red, one of them that is material that's green, one of them that's blue, and then we open these sequentially. Then what comes out will be basically the different materials in a sequential way. And if we open them all simultaneously, then all of these things will come out. So this really allows us to really code the fibers that are coming out and have a lot of control over what uh, their properties are. So these are some examples of that, but it's pr pretty soon you can see there's a lot of um, iterations here. So for example, you can take the same three channels and then be able to have regions where multiple channels are open. You don't only change the chemistry along the fiber, but you can also change the topography. You can have other schemes where you can have uh, specific uh, surface structures and even multi-phase systems like air bubbles, oil droplets, or cells um, embedded in these extruded fibers as well. So having done this, it really doesn't take too much um, additional thought to start putting these upstream from the nozzles and 3D printers and then be able to have multi-material printers that can um, start putting um, different types of um, materials on demand. So here um, you can build structures that have different materials on different layers as you build them, or even have both of those materials expressed as you start building these structures. And all of these can be done in a very efficient way and in a very um, uh, basically robust way and with, um, in a fairly decent resolutions. And of course, you can kind of build on this kind of capability. So here we have um, uh, other things um, that we can do. For example, here having a more advanced printer with seven different inlets in which you can actually start combining these in different um, um, kind of ratios. So you can imagine how many different types of combinations of these you can have, which is uh, gives us significantly more power to um, scale these and really have additional capability compared to the standard printers now. Um, and just to show you um, some of these, you know, you can see that um, these printers um, can um, you know, ro very robustly be able to print different types of things. And where we are going now with these is actually enabling these in making um, different types of tissue structures. Um, uh, for example, being able to <coughs> make different types of uh, materials that are deposited with different cell types um, and then um, surround them with different yeah, different types of materials and different cells and then build complexity using these types of systems. And of course, this platform um, is not only applicable to nozzle-based printers, but it's also applicable to what we call stereolithographic type printers. These are printers that are um, operate based on shining a pattern of light onto a surface and cross-linking that material at the surface and then being able to build layers on top of each other using this process. So using this kind of platform, um, we can also have this um, idea of being able to pass different types of materials uh, through that plane so that as you pass different materials, you can basically cross-link different types of systems. So initially, let's say you cross-link um, the star and then you can change um, the liquid around it through the mechanism that I mentioned, and then be able to print um, um, a, a basically a, a red component around it. So the, these kinds of things also allows us to now um, build um, layers on top of each other. So here you can see that um, we can apply this types of principles to these types of printers so we can move the stage down and build um, one layer and then change the sample, build a different layer, and then be able to add um, and build complexity in different ways. And of course, these are all early stage uh, work, but one can imagine how these types of processes can um, really enable um, this field as a whole. Um, so with that, um, I'll just go back. I wanna end the talk on time and have some time for questions. But um, you know, as I mentioned um, throughout the talk here, um, we think that there's a lot of opportunity in going beyond the normal omics when it comes to the personalized medicine world. Um, and as you know, the whole concept of omics is being able to take um, patient specimens, uh, be able to run uh, genomics, proteomics, and other types of um, assays on it, be able to identify the right targets to be able to um, guide the right therapy. But um, 
In addition to this, which is very powerful, we think that there's a lot of opportunities in um, using um, engineering approaches to um, enable personalized um, implants and uh, tissue fabrication, um, make the right kind of microphysiological models, be able to make the right materials and devices to really complement this and using this as a whole holistic system um, um, around it. So with that, um, you know, I think um, definitely people, um, whoever is interested um, can uh, contact us. Um, our website is terasaki.org. Um, and we're currently definitely are um, hiring a number of different people in different positions. So for people um, who have the appropriate background and timing, we'd love to um, um, have a chat. And also um, with respect to um, um, kind of where we think things are going, I like this picture a lot because it's a uh, really um, a kind of clever picture uh, by um, Rene Magritte, which, which was an artist around the turn of past uh, last century. Um, and, um, and basically what, what he's uh, shown here, he's like looking at the egg and drawing the bird that's emerging from it. And in many ways, I think all of the research that we do is um, applicable to this. Um, I think um, we should all see the bird in, in what we're doing. Um, thank you very much. And now I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ali, for your fantastic and inspiring talk. And if the you know, forum is open for question, if anybody has any question. Any question? You can put it in the chat or just unmute and ask Daniel. Yeah, I think Courtney might have a question. Um, yes, hello. sorry, I, I was trying to unmute. <laughs> um, Ali, this, this, this is an amazing presentation and thank you for sharing those um, technology uh, technologies and the, there's so many things in it. Um, so my background is exercise and exercise physiology. So I'm very interested as well to have your thoughts on um, would those techniques and models be able to be applied in different physiological uh, situations, particularly, for example, trying to mimic exercise, for example, muscle contractions, or trying to understand even how potentially some drugs potentially have a differential impact, you know, if someone is just uh, mostly sedentary or when someone, for example, gets into exercise rehabilitation, which is a key aspect of quite a lot of chronic disease now. But I think we have so very limited understanding on the interaction between uh, you know, drugs and treatments and the impact of getting on the move again. And this could be an opportunity to, you know, um, really personalize both the exercise and the treatment. Uh, so just, yeah, I would like to have your views on, sure. on that. No, that's a great question. Um, so obviously I'm, I'm a little biased. I, I think that, you know, these techniques would be very applicable, um, but Having said that, I'm not a specialist in uh, muscle physiology. So I would say it definitely requires um, folks like me to talk to experts like you and come up with um, the right ways of designing systems that could address that. I do know that there is a number of different muscle um, kind of organs on a chip systems out there, things that um, have shown to be fairly um, um, kind of biomimetic in many ways. Um, they, they, they basically can, you can um, stimulate them with electrical. You can even have um, neuromuscular um, interactions and junctions developed. So there's a lot of um, opportunity in that space to really see if it can be used for real uh, physiological assessment um, when it comes to, let's say, exer exercise and other things. Um, I think that there's a lot of opportunity and the field is really at the beginning of it. Um, and it, you know, what it really needs is getting teams with the right questions, with the right expertise um, to kind of answer them. Um, so, so I have no doubt that down the road, there will be teams of muscle physiology experts and organs on a chip people. In fact, I would say, again, I, I know there's a few people online here um, who I've met at University of Sydney, Paribas, for example, who does have a very robust um, um, capabilities of doing similar kinds of things um, as well. Uh, so definitely um, uh, would be a great resource too. Thank, Thank you. you, Ali. Daniel, you have a question, please. 
Yeah, hi. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much for the talk. That was that was really great. And uh, um, eventually I have several questions, but I just I just focus on on one. Um, so um, when you were discussing about your uh, progenia uh, on a chip, um, I think it's uh, um, very interesting the, the fact that you can control the strain and you can really look at um, physical parameter affecting eventually a, a real disease and see uh, an impact. So I was wondering, uh, obviously, if you're looking at smooth muscle cells and stiffness of the vessel, um, also the flow rate will change. And so did you, did you investigate also the effect of shear, for example, on the, on the cells and eventually on the specific disease? Uh, and uh, similarly, if, if, you, uh, if you've been investigated this sort of um, physical parameter on other models as well, as you have showed many. Yeah, so, so really good question. So in that particular system, because we were dealing with smooth muscle cells, we didn't really want to express too much shear stress to them because typically they'll shield it a little bit with the you know, basement membrane and endothelial cells. So, um, but if you are having, let's say, endothelial cells in that system, um, it actually would make sense to have the shear as well as the mechanical um, um, deformation. So, so I think questions that would answer, like required endothelial cells would, would require the right um, shear, shear models too. Okay, so sorry, just a quick follow-up. So when you were mentioning, for example, so the uh, organoids where you are actually mixing different types of cells, in that case, you would expect uh, this to be something relevant, I suppose. Yeah, so um, with the organoids, we have them in these kinds of um, basically chambers that flow is going by them. Um, you know, so I think in it really um, for for us to kind of really say we mimic the shear, um, you know, it's it's really important that we apply it to the right cells, and I think the endothelial cells are the ones that would make the most sense in most of our organoids. Um, there are um, the endothelial cells basically reorganized to some kind of capillary-like structures, but because we're not perfusing the liquid directly inside the tissue, it goes around it. I don't think the endothelial cells are really sensing the shear. And because we're having a little bit larger chambers, the shear is not enough on the surrounding so that they actually say the results are getting is because of the wrong shear being applied to the wrong cells. So I would say most of those uh, models are the reason they're predictive is because they are the right cells are interacting with each other, but not necessarily the endothelial cells being very functional in that. Maybe they secrete some molecules, but they're definitely not sensing the right shear um, that they would in the body. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, Li Feng. Yeah, Li Feng, by the way, is one of my old colleagues. Uh, he was in my lab many, many years ago. So a great guy. Hi, everybody. Yeah, nice seeing you here, having this talk in Sydney, this environment. Um, really nice to see you again. So I have one question. I'm quite interested in the spider 3D printing stuff you mentioned just now. You're saying like spider biomimetic approach. Uh, they have two glands, which can have two different materials. Then when they mix, they have very strong fibers being produced. So you take this uh, idea into 3D printing, also with mixing materials. So for that bit, can you like expand a little bit and uh, elaborate a bit about, are you like using the 3D printing different 3D printer head, like for example, two di different printing head, or you pre-mix them together, then you put into this uh, 3D printing process. So what we did um, with those printers is we basically, um, you know, took the, uh, the basically XY, um, you know, the plate that moves X, Y direction. We attach it to a computer and basically so that we had control over that. And then we had our own uh, basically nozzle setup that was co uh, connected to our microfluidics. So it was a basically homemade system. Now, um, since um, we've done that work, there is a company that is um, kind of following the same trends in, in Vancouver and Canada called Aspect Biosystems. And they're kind of, um, I think, have done a lot of work on that types of things um, as well. Thank you. Elham, would you like to ask your question? Thank you, Ali. Very inspiring. I think um, I had a general question relating it to, to the field of my expertise, extracellular vesicle. And I'm just wondering if you guys have 
looked into EVs into your cancer metastatic model or any others? And if yes, like what do you think of the role of extracellular vesicle in precision medicine? Well, um, so we um, have not really looked at it in any way that I would say we've been, we've been interested in it, but we've never really made much progress in it. I think it's very, very important. You know, I can see definitely the organ on a chip models be able to um, be used as models for not only, um, you know, extracellular vesicle, exosome type secretion and understanding that, but also metastasis of the cells and being able to even um, um, kind of uh, go into distant tissues in the microphysiological model. So I can see it being very relevant. Um, and I think exosomes in general are, are super interesting because I see that they can actually be a very powerful way to modulate the internal um, kind of machinery in the body. So, and so, so I, I'm, a, I'm a fan of the whole um, exosome world. We just haven't done uh, much in it. Wonderful. Maybe I need to get in touch to, with you setting up a project or a collaboration in future. Sounds great. Thanks, Ali. There are a couple of questions in the chat. One is by Isak. Would you like to ask your question yourself or Mrs. Isak? Yeah, sure. Um, hey, thanks. Thanks very much for the talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I was just wondering, so, you know, I've been involved in a little bit of bioprinting, um, mostly from a technical side of things. So I didn't actually understand the biology. <laughs> um, very much. Uh, I'm just, yeah, I'm curious. So your resolution, your printing resolution is about half a millimeter in most printer setups. Um, is that actually high enough resolution to, you know, create, um, to print organs or some sort of, or the desired cellular architecture, or are we like running up against a limit to what we can do with, you know, filament deposition printing and we, do we need a new printing method? Um, yeah, no, good, good question. I think there's a couple of things in that space. One is, um, I think printers are generally getting better and better. Now they're never not going to become like you know like five micron resolution when it comes to cells and you know gels and all that stuff, right? But they are getting better. I would say you know having something fifty or you know one hundred to fifty is actually fairly doable, fairly standard. Now, but um, but obviously. If you're trying, if your thinking is that you're going to get to print like every single capillary and every single you know structure, that's not the way to do it. I think um, um, the the general idea is to get the cells in the right environment and have them reorganize into those um, basically more fine structures um, that are um, there in native biology. And so you basically um, put the cells in cl close enough proximity to each other. So that they can they can do that, um, but uh, but basically um, not um, um, not too too like not you don't need to get super high resolution I guess if you're getting them close enough to reorganize. Thank Thanks you. Uh, as in interest of time, we just uh, have one more question. Sepe, would you like to ask the question yourself, or would you like me to read from the chat? Uh, no, uh, thank you so much for a fantastic talk. My quick question was really um, on the application of microfluidic disease modeling and if it could be applied to cancer metastasis to study the effect of drugs on that. Yeah, no, definitely. That's a very, very interesting area. Um, I haven't seen too much work in it. I know that um, people are interested. Obviously, metastasis is so important and if you can model it. Um, in an in vitro system is very uh, relevant. Um, it's a very good area to go into. I not much work in it, in it yet, but um, it could be very powerful. Thank you. We'll be in touch with you, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and we are approaching 11 a.m. Please join me to thank Ali for his uh, fantastic and inspiring talk. And I'm sure there will be a lot of potential for establishing collaboration with Terasaki Institute in future. Thank you everyone Thank for you joining everyone. us also for this uh, presentation and sending us this. Yeah, and thank you, Benjamin and Fariba. I really appreciate everything. Thank Take care, you. guys. Thank you. Ali. Brilliant seminar. Lovely to hear that. Stay safe.